college students have long played a role in shaping history by organizing, demonstrating, and speaking out against what they see as unjust and wrong. They became famous for their dissent on Vietnam and then used the tactic of public gathering to call attention to a range of issues throughout the last four decades. It is this history, the history of protest and student activism at UC San Diego, that Professor Jorge Mariscal wanted to share with a group of incoming freshmen. For the second year now, Mariscal has teamed with Professor David Pello to create opportunities for students to meet and learn from community activists, something they both believe is a key component to a public education. We think that if you look at history, that social change really occurs in a number of ways, but two of the most important ways that social change occurs is from the top when the powers that be uh, either gain power or intensify that power, or from the bottom when, when groups of people, sometimes majorities of people, rise up in, in grassroots formations to challenge uh, various power structures. And it's really clear to me that uh, if you look across the planet uh, over the last century, some of the most important sites of social change have been universities. When you talk to African American or Latino families here in San Diego, they'll often say, well, when we drive by the five and we look up in the woods there in La Jolla, we think that's a private university. Um, we had no idea that our children could actually go there. And so the location of UCSD has historically removed us from working class communities and the kind of activism that we're interested in, especially with working class communities of color. So we feel that um, one way to reconnect the campus um, is to expose students to people working at the grassroots and you know, across a variety of issues, but really it's just the, the generic notion of making a difference locally that we're very interested in promoting. It's somewhat cliche-ish, but if, if you have two choices, and one is to view students as repositories for sort of prefabricated knowledge so that they can go out into the world and be cogs in, in a corporate or governmental machine, that's one model, and, and I think, unfortunately, that's the dominant model. Uh, but, but throughout history, and, and we're continuing this tradition, we see education, we see universities as a place where people can integrate critical thinking and action. I think students want to make a difference um, and that goes for college students and people who aren't even going to come to this college. Just young people in general really want to make a contribution but it's not clear to them how best to do that. Mariscal chose to provide some answers by using examples from the past in a seminar called The People's History of UCSD. Well it's a history from below and there are some histories of UCSD that are kind of booster histories about how great it is and certainly it is great in the you know, amount of resources we have and other things. But what we wanted to look at were the social movements that have cropped up here over the years um, beginning as early as the 1960s. It's telling the story of people who have tried to change UCSD to become a more democratic institution. The students began with a tour on foot we visited some of the sites where the deep history, the deep structures of the institution are visible. We started at the monument there in the parking lot outside the Price Center that explains that this used to be a marine base. And so if you read this, you can see the Marine Corps symbol. From 1917 to 1964, over a million Marines and other shooters received their rifle marksmanship training here. This site was deeded to the University of California of San Diego on the 6th of October, 1964, for the pursuit of higher education. Let's move over to the Price Center and go up those stairs. Well, they've done a photo exhibit inside the Price Center lobby there, and it's very interesting. My point to the students was you have to look for what's not there because you didn't see very many people of color at all, and you didn't see some of the larger protests that have taken place. So the founder, really, of this campus is Roger Revelle. And you can see here, was originally a geologist who became an oceanographer and was a very important scientist down at the Scripps Institute. He's the one who really wanted a campus here. Um, there was uh, another group of people that wanted a UC campus in San Diego, but they wanted it in San Diego, right? But Revelle and his political contacts put a lot of pressure on uh, the university to build it here in La Jolla. And I think in class we've already talked about 
what the consequences of that were, right? La Jolla is extremely wealthy, not particularly diverse, and um, removed from working class communities. So Ravel had to convince the politicians that the campus should be put here. One problem was he had a lot of Jewish faculty scientists that he wanted to bring on board. Uh, so the state had to give land to house the Jewish professors because the racism in La Jolla was so powerful that you could not sell a house to a Jew. So if you talk about um, the student efforts to change the campus, especially in times of great upheaval like the late 1960s and early 70s, you don't see much up here. Um, it's kind of balloons and celebrations and food and fun and stuff, when in fact a lot of activist students were working very hard to make a difference here. Next, a visit to the Chancellor's Complex. All the top level administrators have their offices right in here. Uh, a lot of the work is actually done. Students never walk in there and they know that it's kind of the seat of power of campus, but they're a little bit fearful of walking through there. And so I took them right into the complex and right in front of the chancellor's door and I said, look, you know, students just like you have come here and demanded things from the chancellor and knocked on this door and uh, I'm not recommending this, but people have broken windows in the past and made other demands. Um, and I said to them, the people in these offices are just people. And then across campus to Ravel Plaza. Well, you know, the high point of the contestation of UCSD's character was really in the late 1960s and early 70s because of everything that was happening around the world. Um, and so up until the early 90s, Ravel Plaza was kind of the ground zero of student activism on this campus. There was a German philosopher who taught here in the early years named Herbert Marcuse, who was a Marxist. And he used to speak here. Um, that remember that this was during the period that is called the Cold War. So because he was a Marxist, all of the conservative folks in San Diego would write articles and letters to the newspaper saying there's a communist teaching at UCSD. We have to get control of this. He's misleading the students and creating problems, right? His student, uh, a graduate student who came with him when he came here from the East Coast, was an African-American woman named Angela Davis. Angela Davis was a radical black uh, activist who went here briefly. Now, right where I'm standing, right about here, in 1970, a man named George Wynne um, felt so deeply that the American war in Vietnam was immoral that he sat right here and put gasoline on himself and lit himself on fire as a protest, uh, following the example of the Buddhist monks in Vietnam who would often self-immolate as a form of protest. Um, and finally, some face time with two campus activists of the 90s who now have jobs helping minority students so succeed in college. You know, the visit of Juan Astorga and Agustino Rosco um, was very personal to me because they're former students of mine. They came here in the early 90s. And they were a cohort that was very, very active um, in trying to change the institutional structures of, of UCSD. Particularly because I came here as an affirmative action student. And so at the time, um, affirmative action was very strong at the university um, in some good ways and in some negative ways. And I really felt like a lot of the time that I was an outsider at this place and that people were telling me things like um, that I didn't belong, um, that I had taken someone else's place being here, um, that I wasn't going to get through the university. And so I really felt like when I got here, I had something to prove. And so a lot of my activism came from the fact that I was feeling like I always was going against the grain and trying to prove to someone that I belonged here and that this, that this was someone that, a space that I could feel like I could make my own as well. So my parents, um, when they immigrated to the United States, we came into San Diego, you know, and my father was a welder. He uh, had a sixth grade education. My mom went to the third grade. She uh, cleans houses even to this day. So she'll jump on a bus, travel two hours, clean someone's house, and then come back two hours to come home. And so our reality was very different. They never had an, you know, an education, but they came here and they kept telling us, you know, we're here in the United States for you so you can get an education. We don't know what that means, but go. And so when I came to UCSD, you know, they were just proud. You know, my mom couldn't even say UC San Diego. La Universidad de California, ay, 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 la que está por allá. You know, and so that was it, you know. And, uh, but it was an interesting experience because 
even though they did not know how to support me by saying, you know, how are your tests? What's going on with your midterms? What's a final? And it was still difficult to explain to them why I study at eight o'clock at night in the library because they'd be like, I don't know, and that's you know, whereas my parents were like, you know, their way of, of supporting us was sending a little, you know, you know, tortillas and, and you know, and some frijoles, you know, or, or my mom, when I, was, when as I was leaving, you know, she would slip a 20 in the pocket and be like, don't tell your dad, you know, mm -hmm. things like that, you know. And when we got here, as I was saying, you know, the activism that was nurtured for us was, was amazing, you know. And for me in high school, I, I wasn't a student. You know, I was, I went to 11 different high schools. I was hardcore Cholito, you know, a little gang member, and through my active involvement in that, you know, I, I, I was hurt so many different times. To this day, I'm blind from my right eye and I'm deaf from my right ear for having been shot in the back of the head as a teenager. Like I was seeing, you know, I had my own, you know, sense of having been here as an affirmative action student. I didn't do all the classes, so when I applied, they allowed me in as a conditional admin, and I had to meet certain requirements to be admitted, you know, and even then, I doubted myself as a student, and, and in, in very big ways, I was scared of just being a student, 100% a student, because what if I was a student and I didn't succeed? So I would channel my energy into my activism and had that ready-made answer. Well, of course I got a C in that class because I did 10 hours of this, 20 hours of that, 32 hours in one day of that, and it was only 24 hours in the day, right? So that was my, my easy out. But the only classes that I ever truly got, you know, bomb grades in were the ones that spoke to me in my history and my experience, you know. You know, Chicano War in the Border Region, right. mm -hmm. you know, Mariscal's class, you know, Chicanos in Vietnam War, things like that where I was looking and seeing and be, seeing myself reflected back and understanding that that spoke to me. And yet in all my other classes, I, I was one of three Chicanos. I came in kind of feeling already behind, I had to take subject A my first quarter, so I felt further behind, and I, uh, I work with students a lot who take the subject A class and are worried about, you know, do I have what it takes to be here? And I ended up becoming a Spanish lit major, which I thought, wow, from not feeling like I could write at all to feeling like I can read these big fat books on Quixote that I had to take a class with <laughs> for somebody's Mariscal and write papers in Spanish and do things that I thought I never could do. It was definitely something that gave me a lot of confidence. As we began to look at ourselves and, and start getting involved, you know, we started to really realize that there is an interconnection, that we just cannot create change on our campus. There's things going on in our communities, you know, and mm -hmm. one of the most memorable experiences that we had was that we had to organize counter protests as well. Mm -hmm. um, when we were undergrads, um, some right wing Republicans from Orange County started coming in and doing this campaign called Light Up the Border campaign. And their way of lighting up the border was that they were going to you know, put a face to the reality that immigration, illegal immigration, was destroying our communities and they were bringing in diseases, as a woman had, who had been, was interviewed has said. Right. Illegal very, reminiscent of, very reminiscent of the Minutemen now. Yes, right? very reminiscent mm -hmm. of the Minutemen. And so they would drive down, park in front of the border in San Isidro, and then just you know, light up the border with their headlights. And, so what we started to do was organize counter protests, you know, where we would get, you know, tinfoil, mirrors, black, you know, curtains, and we'd be across the street flashing them back. You know, and you know, and we, we would wait until they left, you know, and that was our, our our notions of, you know, our activism is doing these things, you know. And funny story though, you know, is that my parents never knew about my activism at that time. And so they would tell me and call me and they'd be like, Don't estás en la librería? Get, I called you yesterday. I was in the library too. You're like, not uh because I saw the news and you were right there at the protest. <laughs> you know, and it's true that there's a picture of me with a mirror and I'm like I was thinking back to when you were talking about uh, places that you had visited um, in, in terms of around the campus and, and things, and it brought me back to when we had our first protest. Mm. So we, uh, as freshmen, got involved with a lot of students who were older, and that's one of the reasons I think I became so active on campus, too, was at Summer Bridge, some of our mentors, what we called um, peer counselors at the time, or now ATCs, were a little bit older and were involved in some of the things that were on campus in terms of METRA and student government. And at the end of the first year, uh, our first year, they wanted to have a protest because there were a lot of things that were happening on campus that had to deal with race or ethnicity. And so we had a, a protest called the death of racism. And so we had stayed up the night before and made mm. these big coffins that we carried through the campus to kind of show that racism was dead on the campus. One of the things, too, though, that, uh, that was quite telling for us as we were building you know, these coffins the night before, the police, we were, we were doing it in the price center, you know, in, in the back, and the police kept driving around and then just kind of circling and telling us, oh, we're just here to make sure you guys are okay. 
-hmm. you know, and then be like, well, there's people over there. Go make sure they're okay too. Go, <laughs> you know, and and so things like that, you know. And when we were doing the protest, we took the, you know, the typical protest march would go from the Price Center or the or the place where we were going to. Which is just opened, by the way. Mm -hmm. right? It just we, opened. We got here the, first, the year that it just it opened. It opened in open. April. Mm -hmm. Then we walked to the Chancellor's office, you know, casually knock on the, on the door, right? You know, see if they would answer. They wouldn't. <laughs> then go to the Vice Chancellor, speak out in terms of what wasn't happening. Then take it across the campus and walk through the walkways. And we ended up in Ravel. And there was about 300 people at this protest, you know. And one of the telling things for us is we were speaking and, and putting down we started to look up into the corners and up into the, the buildings, and there were people photographing us, you know, and then talking about who was organizing these, you know. And later on, did we not realize that sometimes certain administrators on the campuses were asked to walk, supposedly to, you know, support the student protest, but what they were doing is looking to see which students were there so that they can begin to be the troublemakers. We really did a lot of work that day in coalition building. And as a matter of fact, because of that protest itself um, was the inception of the Ethnic Studies Department. So if it wasn't for having a protest like that, there wouldn't be a program like Ethnic Studies on the campus now, because that was one of the 10 demands that we had given the chancellor at the time that we were tired of kind of dis dis disenfranchised kind of areas. And there, there was a Chicano Studies major at the time, but there was it was a very small program and it wasn't very supported and there was all these other things that were happening. And so we wanted to have something to unify us, as unified as we were as students. And so that was one of the things that we decided that we wanted to put on the demands that we gave to the chancellor. And at the time, you know, the Student Affirmative Action Committee, SAC, had um, representatives from each of the organizations, and the, the chairs would then meet with the Vice Chancellor, back then, Joe Watson, to address notions of what was happening, you know. And there was this, you know, relationship, quote unquote, because it would be an opportunity to bring up, you know, these are the things that are happening, you know. We're dropping in numbers in terms of students of color, in terms of admissions. We're not having support, you know. The, you know, the, the funds that are available for creating opportunities, you know, are not there. And so we became kind of strategic in, in looking back in terms of the things that we did and our activism. And so my activism became more about getting involved at the campus wide level in terms of student government. And so at the end of my first year, I ran for a sophomore senator position with AS. And uh, my mentor at the time was AS president. So he was someone who was uh, a Chicano, the first Chicano AS president at UCSD and had definitely mentored me since I got into Summer Bridge and uh, kind of encouraged me to continue on. And so my involvement became a lot more with student government and doing things at the, at the broader level. So much so a couple of years later, I ran for president and I uh, was AS president my junior year at UCSD. When we started as first years, you know, we had this question of I don't know what to do and I don't know how to do it. You know, and sometimes, you know, our own fear of needing to do it right kept us sometimes from just jumping in. And little by little, we just started to trust the process, you know, and understanding that as we learned about our histories and as we understood the, the historical perspectives on this campus and what was and continues to be the fact that this campus will always have to just wait. And they say, they say that. We wait until four years, they'll graduate, and it doesn't become an issue no more. And so then we became more involved in creating this sense of taking other people under your wings, mentoring them, keeping the reality of what's happening, and really empowering others to create change as well so that when we're no longer here, what happens then? How do you maintain the fight and the activism and creating change for social justice? Yeah. So I wanted to, uh, to go back to a time then when we were in our senior year. Rodney King, the stuff with Rodney King was happening on campus, and that was a very, very, I think, another poignant moment in my uh, career here at UCSD as a student. Um, so the trials were happening for Rodney King, and students were um, kind of watching intently to see, you know, the whole nation was watching intently to see what the results were going to be from the police officers, you know, were they going to be found guilty or innocent for beating up this black man in a really brutal and, cru and really messed up way. So if you see any of the footage of, of what happened, I mean, you can probably still find it on the internet now and see how they yanked this guy out of his car and beat him up really, really badly. And, you know, people were kind of expecting that these cops were going to be, you know, found guilty for this thing. And lo and behold, you know, the court is held in this very white area of um, the Los Angeles County area, Simi Valley. Simi Valley, and all of a sudden um, he gets found innocent, I and mean, they get found innocent. And so for us, at the time, we were still dealing with a lot of crap here on campus too, and for some reason that really sparked something with us too. We got really, really pissed off at the fact that this has happened, and it kind of mirrored our own reality, you know, that things were happening on this campus like that all the time. 
where people weren't being punished for the things that they were doing that were totally against you know what the university says about diversity or uh, things like that and so that really really pissed us off so um the day I, that night a group of students got together at the price center and had a, a really um kind of a blowout kind of protest um, and then we decided that we were going to get back together the following day and had a huge, huge protest at the Price Center the following mm -hmm. day uh, where we got together. Uh, we decided that we were going to go um, and go back to the, the chancellor's office. But before, we were going to take a little trip to the police department and knock on the doors of the police department and talk to the police about some of the things that we were pissed off at. And that was rather interesting to see kind of students and police kind of nose to nose kind of going at it. and. A whole bunch of people in the back kind of just, you know, uh, the police were scared that day, definitely. I don't think that they had enough people to kind of deal with the stuff that we were talking about. Um, then we went to the chancellor's office after that, um, and you can chime in anytime. I'm really excited right. about this. But uh, And so we walked to the chancellor's office, and that's when, again, we, we politely knocked on the door, uh, or as I like to say, we were banging on the walls. Uh, definitely that was a, a very exciting moment for me. Uh, from the chancellor's office, we went down to the hump, right? Mm -hmm. and we had another protest there. And we ended the day there, and it just felt really good. And someone suggested that we get back together for the third day. Mm -hmm. So we decided we were going to get back together at the hump the following day. Um, and so we did. And from there, we decided that we were going to um, we were going to go toward the freeway. That we were that we were going to make a statement here on campus because we were pissed off about a lot of things that were happening. So we were going to really make a statement by um, sitting in front of the freeway and, and closing some of the traffic. It was a Friday afternoon. Um, and, and kind of letting people kind of shine some light on the things that happened on this campus because we really felt ignored. We really felt like we didn't have a voice on this campus and it was time to do something that was going to be poignant that people were going to see and say, wow, what's happening on that campus that students are so pissed off? So originally it was just to close off the street in Via La Jolla right there where the gas station is. Mm -hmm. And then we just kind of got carried away with each other's energy because there's about two, three hundred people here. You know? Probably more than that, I think, at the time. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And so then slowly but surely, you know, we ended up just marching towards the, the five and coming down that ramp going south. Right. One later in the time we took it until right. we stopped it. And the entire freeway stopped. Right. And it backed up at least three or four miles. If that, if people were that. pissed because they had to, you know, be routed into different areas to go through La Jolla or whatever to get back onto the freeway to get home because people were heading south to go home. Um, so we, we closed the freeway for about three hours, right? Three mm -hmm. and a half hours. But just the feeling of sitting on the freeway and seeing the car stop and, the, and looking south and seeing that there was no one there, that we caused that, that it was us that was there doing something that made a difference. Mm -hmm. that, that was a, one of the most powerful feelings I've ever had in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And then my parents calling us up, are you there? <laughs> ah! You know? And so yeah. when we came back, you know, there the coalition began to choose certain representatives that were going to go and meet with the chancellor. You know, and through this activism, they created the task force, which was chaired by Mariscal again, that looked at, you know, is there a need to develop a center that could speak to the realities of our students and that could then, through their activism, help them. And so through that protest, created the task force that created the, the cross-cultural center. Where you're sitting now. Okay, thank you all very much. Uh, well, I think the visit of Juan and Agustin was probably the high point for a lot of the students in the class because they got to see people who uh, had some of the same experiences they had as high school students. And then, um, you know, they heard about what it might take to make it through UCSD, both academically and socially. Again, UCSD is not known for its hospitality for our students of color. And they talked about the difficult campus climate and the need for students to get involved. Uh, a lot of these students in the class, again, um, are not activists. And I said to them, you know, I said, you're not all going to be like Juan and Agustin. Um, but some of you may choose to be in your second or third or fourth year. And so we want you to, want you to see people who, who tried to make a difference and made things better for you. Um, our class was held in the Cross-Cultural Center, which was a direct result of the activism of people like Juan and Augie. And, um, and I think they were very impressed. It's important because students of color, and, and I'll speak for myself as a faculty of color, uh, often feel the need for a safe space 
a safe space, even if it's just to relax, uh, to, to go study, uh, to read a book, to meet friends, to make friends, um, to develop community, and to make change and to feel, feel empowered. Uh, again, personally speaking, I'll tell you, when I go into the Cross-Cultural Center, uh, I'm there for any number of events. I, I witness uh, sometimes in a day there are dozens of meetings, various organizations, student organizations, uh, classes being taught. I know we've taught our classes there. Some professors have office hours there. Students can really connect with, with faculty and connect with each other there. Uh, I'll come out of the Cross-Cultural Center on many occasions and it's like a transformation. It's like stepping into or out of a portal and I realized, oh, I'm back here at UCSD. It was literally like being in another place, uh, a place where I felt comfortable, a place where I was connecting with people, a place where I could think and, and, and be myself. And it's also something I remember uh, just, a, it was a year, year and a half ago when a lot of the mobilizations were, were occurring nationally and, and especially in California around immigrant rights, uh, around uh, human rights for, for, for newcomers to this country, or people who had been in this country for a while but still didn't have citizenship. And I know the Cross Cultural Center was a key point, a key site on this campus for organizing around that. Students were going in there and out of there every day, uh, you know, right before class, right after class, losing sleep. People were up there till midnight and there was just an energy and an excitement that I don't think could have occurred without that important site that people like Professor Mariscal and others established years ago. Professors Mariscal and Pello will continue hosting seminars in the Cross-Cultural Center throughout the school year, creating the space for students and activists to inspire one another to work toward their common cause of social justice. <laughs>